So first, let's start with what it says, write a mathematical model. What does that mean? Well, a mathematical model is an equation that fits a real world situation. So um, I actually have this, I pulled this from Wikipedia because I thought it did a really nice job of explaining it. So a mathematical model is a description of a system and a system just means like real world situation using mathematical concepts and language. So basically an equation. The process of developing a mathematical model is termed mathematically modeling. You know, that's sort of straightforward. Mathematical models are used in the natural sciences such as physics, biology, earth science, chemistry, and engineering disciplines such as computer science, electrical engineering, as well as in the social sciences such as economics, psychology, sociology, and political science. So a lot of people are like, why am I learning this? Well, actually mathematical models are used in a lot more disciplines than you may think. So that's why we cover this material. So when your model of variation, there's actually a very, um, it's a strict process that you follow. It's very straightforward. So step one is to translate your, whatever your description of the situation is into a variation model. So you're translating the words into mathematics. Then you plug in any given ordered pairs you have and solve for your unknown constant, which we call K. Once you know what K is, you rewrite the model using plugging in the value for k but leaving all other variables as variables so that the only number you're replacing is k and then that's your mathematical model and then once you have your model you can answer any additional questions that may follow sometimes there's follow-up questions so we're going to be going through this process in this um this presentation so there are essentially four different types of variation there is direct variation which is as one thing changes, the other changes proportionally. So if it increases, then something else also increases. Or if it decreases, then something else could be decreasing. Um, but they basically, they have the same, there's a relationship between the two. And if they're changing proportionally, when you write a proportion, you have fraction equals a fraction. So basically you have y, and x they are proportional so they are in the same parts of the fractions and then you may have some other things going on um, in the other parts of the proportion so that's what we mean by proportionally um, and that they're changing at the sort of at the same rate now inverse variation sort of sounds the same thing as one thing increases the other decreases proportionally so that means they're going in opposite directions. So if you were to write a proportion here, what happens is because they're in the opposite direction, they're in different parts of the proportion. So the direct, they're both at the top. Inverse, actually, the, the input is in the denominator. Combined is where as one thing increases, you have multiple items, one of them increases and then another one decreases. So it's kind of you have two things going on, one going up, one going down. Um, and then so this could be if we wrote this as a proportion. So let's say your output is Z, you could have X and Y. One is changing at the same rate as Z, the other one is decreasing, so it's in the denominator. And then we have joint variation where you have one thing changing and then two things are changing at the same rate proportionally. So that could be that they're both on top. It could be like you have Z and you have some proportion and you could have X and Y in the same part of that proportion. So those are the four different types of variation and the difference is really where your X and Y go. Where do your input variables go? That determines what type of variation you have and the type of variation determines how you write the equation. So those different words are very important. So we're going to start with direct variation. So the statements below are equivalent. So you can see these worded in multiple ways. Y varies directly as X y is directly proportional to x, or y equals k times x. k is always that constant of variation, a constant that we don't know that we need to find. But there's some relationship, relationship between x and y 
And they're basically, they're, they're not in any fraction, it's just y is equal to something times x. That's a direct proportion. If you have a direct variation as some power, then there's an exponent on the x. So it could be the square of x, the x. That's telling you what the exponent is, but the setup is different, or is essentially the same. You just have an exponent on x. So you can see y varies directly as the nth power of x. y is directly proportional to the nth power of x, or y equals kx to the n. So you always have this k in front um, for every variation problem. And then you have an exponent on x or not, depending on the wording. So my first example here is a direct variation. The simple interest on an investment is directly proportional to the amount of the invest. An investment of $6,500 earns $211.25 after one year. Find a mathematical model that gives the interest I after one year in terms of the amount invested P. So they're giving us the variables we're working with. We have to work with I and P. And so when it says mathematical model that gives interest I in terms of something else, that means I is the output. The thing that you're in terms of is the input. So when we translate this, I go back to that first sentence, interest. So I, and you see the word is, is always where we put our equal sign whenever we're translating mathematics. So the verb is always the equal sign. And then directly proportional tells us we have to have that constant. And it's telling us that we're multiplied by the input variable. And so the amount invested is P. So that gives our model. That first sentence is giving us our model. And you're basically are reading it left to right. The model is I equals K times P. So that's step one is to translate into your model. Step two is to plug in the numbers they give you so that you can figure out what K is. So it says that the investment is $6,500. That's P, the amount invested. And it's earning $211.25. So that's I, that's the interest. So I plug these numbers in. 211.25 equals K times 6,500. So that's step two. Step three is to solve that equation. So to solve that equation, I'm solving for k. All I need to do is divide both sides by 6,500. OK, so I'm going to be dividing both sides by that 6,500 so that we can solve for k. And then you just put that on your calculator, 211.25 divided by 6,500. And so I'll move, in my, move my 3 down a little bit. We have 0 0.0325 equals K. Step 4 is to write your model. So step 4, our mathematical model, is we take our equation from step one and we plug in the value for k. So it's i equals 0 0.0325p. And then there's a step five if it asks you a question afterwards, but ours just says find a mathematical model. So now we're done. We have our model. Okay, so example two. Use the fact that 14 gallons is approximately the same amount as 53 liters to find a mathematical model that relates liters y to gallons x. Then use the model to find the numbers of liters in five gallons. So it's saying that the 14 gallons is about the same as 53 liters. So this is saying that they're proportional, so we assume it's direct proportion. So our number of gallons is x. So we're going to say, OK, we're, I'm going to just read it from left to right. So the fact that 14 gallons x is approximately, so that verb is, that's our equals, 
and then the same amount and so this is where we're going to have a direct variation we need to have some constant because it does say approximately it's not going to be exactly the same um, and then as 53 liters and our variable for liters is y so in this case I have x equals k y now it doesn't matter that it's not solved for y that it's x equals because the way the model works is as long as you use the same equation to start with, everything will work out. So we have our mathematical model, and I just wrote it left to right. And it does say, find a mathematical model that relates liters y to gallons x. Well, we are relating liters to gallons, that we have that. Now, step two is to plug in our information. So now we're going to plug in. We know that 14 gallons, so that's x approximately the same as 53 liters. So I can plug in 53 for y. And then step three is to solve that for k. So I'm going to divide both sides by 53. And since these are real world problems, we usually do get the decimal approximations. Um, this particular one does come out kind of nasty, but we'll round it to three decimal places. So it's about 2.264 is equal to k. So then step four is to write your mathematical model. So that's going to be x equals 0.264y. Make sure that four actually looks like a four. Now, this time we do have like a follow-up question because it says use the model to find the number of liters in five gallons. So that would be your step five. You're using this equation to find out the liters for five gallons. So X is the number of gallons. So I'm going to plug that in. I have five equals 0.264Y. And I'm going to just solve for y. We want to find out how many liters there are. So I'm going to divide both sides by 0 0.264. And this comes out to 18.939. So we could say about, we'll say 19 liters. And now we've finished the problem. Now, if you had set up your initial, initial model to put the K with the X instead of with the Y, your K would be different, but you'll still get the same answer in the end. You'll still get 19 liters. That's the nice thing about being directly proportional, is the K can really be on either side, but you have to be consistent about which way you do it while you're going through the whole problem so that your answer in the end is the same. So that was direct variation, and here is inverse variation. So for inverse variation, you have your input in the denominator, and it could have an exponent. It may not have any exponent. Um, but the statements below are equivalent. So you'll see y varies inversely as x, y is inversely proportional to x, or y equals k over x. And so instead of the x in the numerator, it's in the denominator, and that's what makes it an inverse, because it's sort of taking the reciprocal. So example three, a company has found that the daily demand x for its boxes of chocolates is inversely proportional to the price p. When the price is $5, the demand is 800 boxes. Approximate the demand when the price is increased to $6. So step one is to get that model, and we're going to be reading it left to right. So we have the daily demand X, and then we have the word is, so that's our equal sign. And when we see inversely proportional, that's telling us we're going to have a K, and then the inverse tells us that what follows is going to be in the denominator. So it's inversely proportional to the price P, so P is in the denominator. So I'm reading it left to right, building that model. 
step two is to plug in the information you're given in the second sentence so that we can solve for K. So when the price is $5, that's P, the demand is 800 boxes. So this is 800 for X that is equal to K over five. And then step three is to solve for K. So um, that's in order to solve for K, we need to multiply both sides by the denominator. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by five so that I can get rid of the five in the denominator. And five times 800 gives me 40, uh, comes out to 4,000. So it's just five times eight is 40 plus two zeros. And that is equal to K. Step four is your mathematical model. So our mathematical model, we take our answer in the step one, we plug in K. So X equals 4,000 over P. Then it says approximate the demand when the price is increased to $6. So that's step five. And so we want to find out what X is when P is, so I just plug six in for P. 4,000 divided by six, and it says approximate, so we can round this, because we get six, six, six point six seven. It's basically six repeating. So we can say it's about 667 boxes. And that would be the demand. And it's, notice that when the price increased, the demand went down. That is a hallmark of inverse variation, that when one thing increases, something else goes down. So that's inverse. While um, in the direct, what tend to happen is one thing increases, so does the other thing. They sort of both do the same thing at the same time. Joint variation is where you have things that are both increasing, or the, it's direct, but with multiple variables. So you'll see Z varies jointly as X and Y. Z is jointly proportional to X and Y. And Z equals K times X, Y for some non-zero constant K. And you can also have exponents on the X and exponents on the Y, so you have to pay attention to the wording. But everything is multiplied here. So example four. The work W required to lift an object varies jointly with the object's mass and the height of the, that the object is lifted. The work required to lift a 120 kilogram object, 1.8 meters, is 2,116.8 joules. Find the amount of work required to lift a 100 kilogram object, 1.5 meters. So step one. We're translating, and we've taken that first sentence. So it says the work required. So that's going to be W. It gives us W. Um, and then it doesn't have the word is, but it does have the word varies. That's another verb. So if you're if you're good at English, this can help you translate into math. You look for those verbs. So varies. That's a verb. So that's going to be our equal sign. And um, that's also going to indicate because it says the word varies. It's variation. That's going to tell us we have our constant K. And then jointly means everything that follows is multiplied together. So what follows is the object's mass m, so that's m, and then the height h. So all of those are multiplied together. Step two is to take that second sentence and plug in your information. So it says the work required, that's 2,116.8 joules. We don't know k. Um, it's 120 kilograms, and we're lifting it 1.8 meters. Now, we don't have to worry about units here. K um, sort of takes care of that for us, because if you know the work formula, you might be like, oh, well, I have to make sure everything is in, like, you, know, you might be worrying about units. You don't have to, because any unit conversions you would do, you can kind of do with K. K can take care of that for you. When you solve for K, it's already embedded those unit conversions, as long as you are consistent with your units here, as long as you, the units you plugged in for step two are the same units you used for the last step, 
you're fine. You don't have to worry about unit conversions. So step two, we're plugging in those values. Step three is solving. So I have to first multiply by 120 by 1 1.8. So this one's going to be a couple more steps. 120 times 8 gives me 960. So that's going to be 960K. Then I need to divide both sides by 960 so that I can solve for K. And so 2116.8 divided by 960. 2.205 equals K. Step four, you write your mathematical model. So I'm going to put this up to the right. Our mathematical model is W equals 2.205 MH. Now we do have a final question here. Find the amount of work required to lift a 100 kilogram object 1.5 meters. So the units are the same units we had in step two, kilograms and meters, so we don't have to do any unit conversion. We just plug them in. So W equals 2.205 times 100 times 1.5. So you just multiply that out, and it comes to 330.75. And then our units are joules. So that's an example of joint variation. It's just the things are all multiplied together. Everything that follows the word joint, those are all multiplied. Example 5. The cost of constructing a wooden box with a square base varies jointly as the height of the box and the square of the width of the box. So it says the square of the width, that's giving us an exponent. Constructing a box of height 16 inches and of width 6 inches costs 2880. How much does it cost to construct a box of height 14 inches and of width 8 inches? Step one, our model. So they're not giving us any variables, so we can use whatever variables we want. I try to pick ones that make sense. So it says the cost, so I'm going to use C for cost. And then it says varies jointly, so that's telling us we've got our verb varies. And then we've jointly, I need to have that constant. And everything that follows is multiplied. Jointly is the height of the box, so I use H for height. And then it says the square of the width. So if I use W for width, the square of the width means it's W squared. So you have to pay attention to words that indicate exponents. So now I have my model. Step two is to plug in the information that they give us in the second sentence. So constructing a box of, let's see, we've got our height of 16 inches, width of 6, cost is 28 80. So I'm going to plug in all of these numbers they give us. And then step three is to solve. So first I have to square the six because we need to follow the order of operations. So 2880 equals K times 16 times 36. Now I need to multiply 16 times 36. So 16 times 36 is 576. So I have 2880 equals 576K. Now I need to divide both sides by 576 to solve for K. So 2880 divided by 576. And this comes out to 0 0.05 equals K. So step four, plug K back into step one. So C equals 0 0.05 HW squared. That's our mathematical model. Then we actually have a question to answer. How much does it cost? So that's going to be in step five. We're looking for cost to construct a box of height 14 inches. So I'm plugging 14 for H. 
and a width 8 inches. So I'm plugging in 8 for W. So I need to square the 8 first. So it's 0 0.05 times 14 times 64. And then I multiply those all together. And we get $44.80. So um, that's, that's the price. You can see the price increased as the width increases. The height actually slightly decreased, but uh, the price still overall increased. So when it says jointly, that's one of the things you have to think about is like just changing. You're, not, you're changing multiple things in different ways. Combined variation is where you have direct and inverse variation. So z varies directly as x and inversely as y. So they're going on at the same time. You still have a constant. It's always on top. But now you've got an x on top, a y in the denominator. And they could have fractions or exponents, I mean. So they could have exponents with it. So this is my last example. This one's not a numerical example, but um, this one does, is good to get a, a, the concept across. So the mathematical, or mathematical, the maximum load that a horizontal beam can safely support varies jointly as the width of the beam and the square of its depth and inversely as the length of the beam. So we've got joint and inverse variation going on here. We've got multiple varios, variables. So um, I'm going to try to translate this. The maximum load, so let's use L for load. We have the word vary, so that equals. We have K, our constant, and jointly, which means the next two things are multiplied. The width of the beam, so that's W. And then square of its depth, so let's use D for depth and then square that. And then it says inversely, so what follows that is now going to be in the denominator and inversely to the length of the beam. So actually, this is going to get confusing if I use, let's use B for beam so that I can use L for length. And so we'll say load is B, and then we have K. W, D squared, L. So now we're going to see how each of these changes. So for part A, what happens if you double the width? If you double the width, if I plug in um, 2W instead of W here, so if I just look at the right side, K times 2W, D squared over L, that tubby, dub, or the, the two gets pulled out. So then you have KWD squared over L. And KWD squared over L is B, so that's 2 times B. So the load doubles. So it's twice the load. Now what happens if you double the depth? So let me switch colors for that. So if I'm doubling depth, so instead of D, I'm going to have 2D squared. So again, I'm going to look on the right side. KW times 2D squared over L. And then I'm going to square. That's going to be KW. When you square 2D, you get 4D squared. So that's... 4 out in front, and then the KWD squared over L, those are all this. So that's just 4 times the load. So the load quadruples, and that's because it's squaring the depth. I probably spelled quadruples wrong. Um, <laughs> I don't spell that word very often. Now let's look at what happens if you have the length. So again, I'm looking at the right side, k, w, d squared. None of those are changing, but now I have 1 half times L. When you're dividing by 1 half, that's the same as multiplying by 2. So that's really 2 
times KWD squared over L. And KWD squared over L is B, so that's 2B. So our load doubles if we half the length. And now this last one, we are having the length and doubling the length, or having the width and doubling the length. So now we're doing multiple things. We have lots of things going on here. So I have my K, I'm having the width. So it's gonna be one half W. And then my depth is the same. And then I'm doubling the length, so that's going to be 2 times L. So that 1 half, that can get pulled out in front. And the 2 in the denominator, that is the same as also having 1 half. And then I have my K, W, D squared over L. So what happens is you get 1 fourth times the, the load of the beam. So we quarter the load because you're, you're taking it in half from the width and then since the length is twice and it's in the denominator that's the same as dividing by two so you're dividing by two a second time and that's how you get one fourth. So that's one of the benefits of writing variation models is that you can actually see what happens as you change different aspects. So if you're trying to get a bigger load, you definitely don't want to double the length because that will actually make the load, it won't, you know, it will get smaller. But you could have the length and you can make your load bigger. So you can see how changing these things changes the relationship with the output and um, kind of helps you if you're trying to design an optimal, um, in this case, horizontal beam.